Welcome and introduction. Um, I wanna thank you for joining us for our session today on design in, in Sparkling Company. I'm Carol Ann Fabian, Director of Collections and Curatorial Affairs at the museum, a member of the exhibit team and the moderator for today's session. The role of design and presentation of an exhibition couldn't be more important. Exhibition design in, <coughs> excuse me, not only makes the physical presentation of the exhibition possible, but more critically, the exhibition design carries and amplifies the curatorial interpretive intent. The curatorial and interpretive goals from the designer form the design remit from which the design team creates an environment that optimizes presentation of the exhibit objects with attention, of course, to the narrative um, that is revealed through the arrangement. Of course, this isn't just an academic exercise, but rather a practical design and build activity operating within the constraints of space, budget, and time to delivery. The development of the design and build process for InSparkling Company was interrupted by the onset of COVID-19. We delayed the exhibition opening for one full year, as you've heard earlier today, and it was a complicating factor for all involved. Nonetheless, the design team persevered and delivered an exquisite exhibition installation, which I hope many of you will be able to visit before the show closes early in 2022. This afternoon, I'm pleased to introduce key members of the design team who worked with me and staff at the museum on planning and executing the exhibition design. First up is Kit Maxwell, um, who by now is likely familiar to most of you. Kit is the museum's curator for early modern glass, curator of the In Sparkling Company exhibition, editor of its ex excuse me, accompanying catalog and or organizer of this year's annual seminar on glass. Kit studied at Cambridge University, the University of London and Glasgow University. He holds a PhD in decorative arts and historic interiors and an MPhil in Nazi era provenance studies. He's currently pursuing research interests in Caribbean studies. Following Kit will be Sarah Lobergolo. She is a partner at Seldorf Architects in New York. Sarah studied architecture at Syracuse University and has been at Seldorf since 1999. She's worked with the Corning Museum on several exhibitions, including Fragile Legacy, Revealing the Invisible, Glass of the Architects, and most recently, In Sparkling Company. And we're very much looking forward to working with Sarah on our special exhibition for next year, so stay tuned. <laughs> Um, and last speaker today will be Warren Bunn, um, dear colleague at the museum. Uh, he is senior manager of collections and exhibitions and has been at the museum for 19 years. Coming to us from his previous post, seven years at the Johnson Museum of Art at Cornell University. Warren is a multi-talented person, musician and artist. He trained as an artist at Hartwick College and hold, also holds a master's degree in museum studies from Syracuse University. Let's start off with Kit though today uh, and ask him to share with us his vision for the physical exhibition. Kit. Um, yeah, I think um, we started considering design in earnest in, I think it was the summer of 2019 in anticipation of opening in uh, May, 2020. So a fairly tight turnaround, but by this point, I, as the curator, had been living with the ideas, the checklist, the kind of the, my own visualization of the exhibition for a few years. And it's a really uh, strange moment to suddenly hand over the kind of the concept to uh, um, a design firm who interpret it. It's kind of a, a nerve wracking moment. You can think, well, what, are you, you know, what is their response going to be? Is it, you know, will they really get it or will they be like, oh, this is what the exhibition's about? Um, obviously, it's a dream to work, any curator's dream to work with a firm like Seldor. Um, but it's also a really personal moment when you kind of hand over the exhibition for design interpretation. So um, there, I went to, uh, to, to Seldorf with Carol Ann and, and Warren and with a few, a few ideas, um, a few themes that I really wanted to carry through um, the exhibition. Some of them more precious than others, uh, I'll admit. But maybe if we go to the first slide, please. or the next, that's it. Um, this immersive zone, at, which is at a strange position at the, sort of the, the beginning of the, the historic galleries on the way to the entrance to the special exhibition space. I wanted to create a kind of immersive zone that 
helped people to connect or become comfortable with the notion of social life in Britain during the 18th century, that it wasn't always this prescribed formality, that people did have fun, and it's something that can be related to uh, in the 21st century. And the idea of including a, a, a neon sign as the, on the title wall was something that came to me at the New Glass Now seminar of 2019. Um, and I'll speak more about that um, towards the end. But again, it's carrying this notion of modernity and, and fun, I think, with a kind of a hint of seediness. I mean, it has sort of transformed that area into kind of an adult spa um, effect, but uh, so I've been told. Uh, anyway, so if we go to the next slide, please. On the other side, we have this curved wall, and that's where uh, we decided to uh, include, well, initially a graphic of Vauxhall Gardens, um, a, an open air event space in the centre of London, as I said in my in my tour, where people from different backgrounds could go and enjoy uh, social life, see art, listen to music, um, have dinner out, outside. And our digital team, as Mandy indicated, uh, went one step further and said, well, why don't we riff off these sort of magic lanterns of the 18th century and actually do a, a projection? And why don't we animate it slightly uh, while we're at it? And then while, we do, while we're doing that, why don't we do some bird song? And Vauxhall, um, in fact, was famous for a, an organ, a pipe organ that played artificial bird song to attendees after the hours of darkness. So it was kind of a, a, a perfect uh, mix. And I'd like to, so Mandy showed you a photo of the, the projection being fitted to this, this curved wall. And I'd like to show you just a, a short video clip uh, which uh, shows the animation with a little bit of the bird sound. So if we could go to the, the video clip and maybe just play 10 seconds of it, I think that will be enough. It's coming. Maybe it's on can, the next slide. We can, I think. we can return to that. Um, yeah, so could we get to slide five then, please? Slide five. Um, anyway, so another notion that I had was the, the color scheme. Oh, here we are. Here we are. This is the projection. So you can see the, the figures moving in the background and the fans wafting and the branches of the trees slightly swaying. Um, it's kind of a, it's a really lovely um, experience. But within the exhibition, I also had ideas about the, the paint colors and I was kind of set on pink and green. Um, it's a color combination that we see in the Northumberland House glass drawing room. This, this, uh, reference to uh, polished porphyry and polished green uh, marble. But it's also a, a color combination that found favor more broadly in the 18th century. If we go to the next slide, please. Slide six, please. Great, great. So yeah, pink and green, you see it in Sevres porcelain of the 1750s, and it's a color combination that I've really always enjoyed in, in Sevres porcelain. But you also see it in, in textiles too, such as the painting um, on the right here. And there's a wonderful portrait of Madame de Pompadour as well, also in this kind of pink and green combination. So that was, uh, that was sort of high on my, my wish list for the exhibition. And I think, I think it's done no harm. Um, next slide, please. And another notion, uh, I, I always really um, enjoyed the, the, the engraved decoration, the Chinese style decoration on this uh, goblet to the left, which is in the exhibition. Um, it's so incredibly uh, detailed and fine. And <clears throat> had the notion of doing 360 degree photography of it. I wanted to capture it just in case you were to use it in merchandising or, or something. I thought it's such a, a lovely uh, motif. Um, but in the end, we used it as a, a, a graphic 
and wrapped it around the base of the dressing table, um, which you can see just about make out in the image on the, the bottom right, to kind of evoke the, the damask that might have uh, hung over such a, a, a dressing table. And we also used it on the around the dessert table too. I the English were particularly fond of mahogany um, without tablecloths, but uh, nevertheless, I thought it's also nice to continue this theme of how the British were naturalizing um, uh, materials design from other uh, cultures um, during the 18th century. And it also enhances the glassiness, reminds, subtly reminds us that this is an exhibition about glass. It kind of permeates uh, beyond the, the, the objects themselves. Next slide, please. And this I alluded to in the, um, in the pre-recorded tour, is reproducing the, the frame of the reverse painted mirror and setting it at the front of the case. It's, it's always really um, depressing. It's disheartening sometimes to look at glass through glass. Um, and it's particularly so looking at a mirror, trying to kind of, it kind of distorts the reflections and the interactivity of the reverse painted mirror, which I think would have been one of its prime attractions uh, in the 18th century. And so by putting this second frame around the outside of the case can give the visitor a sense of looking through or into um, a plate of glass, as I, as I feel that it might have been the case in the 18th century. And this was actually a decision that was born out of mishap, um, if I can allude to that. The, the, the film that we, the reflective film that we placed around this, this window vignette was in fact applied to perspex, not to glass. And so there are a few unsatisfactory bubbles and creases that we needed to conceal. And so the frame to me was an obvious solution. Uh, and I'm really pleased that we were able to do it. I think it, it looks really effective as well. But that's, that's my kind of summary of the curatorial preciousness uh, in design. And it was at this point that I think we're gonna hand over to, to Sarah to talk a bit about Seldorf's. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna jump in for you a are. minute before you Sarah. <laughs> Thanks, Kit. Um, we, it is a set, you know, we've talked earlier today about uh, where the idea of exhibition comes from. And I have to say in the uh, design phase, uh, the ideation continues. And in fact, uh, you mentioned briefly our visit to uh, Seldorf, Warren, you and I, to uh, introduce the exhibition themes and to try to um, inspire them, attract them to wish to work with us on it. And uh, Annabelle Seldorf, the uh, principal of uh, Seldorf Architects, joined us in the meeting uh, with Sarah and some of uh, other associates from the group. Um, and we immediately recognized that this was the right firm for us to be working with. Um, Sarah and Annabelle just were uh, incredibly welcoming, of course, but um, enthralled with the multiple narratives, uh, which is the other part, you know, this interpretive um, mandate really for the ex physical exhibition space to deliver not only this environment that, um, evokes uh, certain aspects, but to deliver a, a, the narrative in a way that is understandable to our visitors. Um, and I think we threw at them the complication of, uh, you know, not wanting a period room, um, but to introduce modernity in and of itself and modernity as having multiple meetings in, in those times and in ours. And I think that um, these complicated um, elements of the remit were uh, embraced and uh, handled so beautifully. And so now I think it's time for Sarah to give us a, a talk about how they uh, melt the challenge <laughs> in great ways. Sarah. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I think the operative word here is complicated because uh, anyone seeing that room, um, that is the exhibition room in its raw form, um, uh, maybe go to the next slide, yeah, is always, um, so perplexing and from the first time that we worked in this space it was like what does one do in the in this environment um so uh but we're up for the challenge and we always really enjoy working with Corning uh because they just always present us with interesting uh topics and it's not just what you what you would one would think you would be talking about but all of the narratives around that 
Um, but this is a great drawing, which really illustrates kind of the beginning. Um, the Corning team was here with us in our conference room. It was really very fluid and fun. And um, hearing their themes and hearing the storylines and the narratives and, and really trying to pull from that and really learn like, well, what, what does this mean? How do, we, how do we manifest this in physical space? So that's always like so much fun and enjoyable. Um, and maybe let's go to the next slide. Um, the, the messiness continues uh, after they leave, actually, uh, still goes on as we, as we work together in our internal team um, and really try to understand um, the, the, how, again, how to express this, this exhibition in, in physical form. And one thing that we, we caught on very early um, with was this, this notion of the life, a day in the life of a, a genteel British, British gentleman or woman. And so we, we, we use that thinking to sort of walk, walk our way around um, the, this space. And so you come in, you maybe go to the left, it's the morning time, it's getting dressed. Um, there's various uh, elements in what we call the mirror wall, which I'll talk about more detail, um, and kind of making your way around the space to ending in sort of the, the dining table and the, the lush, uh, elegant and, and over the top um, end of day with the, with the dining. So that, that sort of obviously not exactly um, you know, a perfect interpretation, but really just a beginning line of how one, one starts a story uh, and, and folds it through the space. And then you can see also here just the, the beginnings of what, what do these objects really look like, size, height, um, et cetera. So maybe next. And then, yeah, here we are getting more specific. Uh, we take all of the, the various elements that will be dispersed around and begin to see them in, in their actual dimensions and how, how will they go after this sort of we've established the circulation narrative. Um, and then, you know, what we really enjoyed was the juxtaposition, obviously, of 18th century with modernity and all that that means. And so that sort of plays itself throughout um, uh, as we move on. I'll, I'll show you in more detail. So after, next slide, sorry. Yeah, so, so one of the first things we do uh, in figuring out an exhibition is actually scaling every single one of the elements. And that's what you see here is to scale the various sizes of the pieces. And that really starts to make things tangible for us. So taking that narrative, plan, planning it out in, on paper, but then, okay, what are these objects? How will they fit, fit uh, in, the, in, in the ways in which we're thinking about them? And so next, and so one of the back wall, the mirrored wall, which you may have heard a number of times referred to, um, we, we had this idea of really making it quite lively with various size shaped um, little portals uh, that really drew you in. Uh, we decided to mirror this as one of the aspects of, of really creating this reflectivity and really kind of the exuberance of the, the glass that we were looking at and the elements that we were looking at. Um, and we were really wanting you to focus very closely. And so we, we thought about these apertures that could be various sizes. Um, and next. And um, and so here we're working with, and Warren is going to talk a little bit more about this probably, but we're walking, we're working with existing um, uh, cap glass cabinets that the museum has here. And, uh, and what we did was put a wall in front of them, mirrored that wall, and, uh, and created these openings. And so the vibrance of some of the variety um, maybe uh, had been slightly diminished once you, you think about the reality of fitting the object on the shelf that exists there, making sure the lighting that's coming from above behind this wall is appropriate um, to hitting the object. Uh, but still, I think that we achieved uh, some of the sort of zeroing in and focus into the, into the, the objects that we wanted the, the, the visitor to take into account. Next. And so here is that wall. Um, 
So again, it uh, sort of getting back to the realities of building um, might have changed this a little bit, but we still felt that it achieved that the um, idea of really zoning in and looking at the objects and then the reflectivity of the mirror film um, was was really very wonderful to be able to see. You can already see the reflections here. And um, as Kit was mentioning, the 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 happy accident of the, of adding the frame um, was was a nice was a nice solution. Next, and so these are just what more kind of drawings that we do where we really just look at every wall flat and really sort of look at the proportion, look at how the casework will will be. Um, and really, you know, get into that detail very carefully of, um, is it right what we're doing? I, I think on the upper left corner, you see, um, there, it says existing vitrine. That's the wall that I was talking about that has existing cabinets where we built in front of. And, and you also see the opening into um, the North Umberland room, which I'll show you momentarily. Next. Yeah, so here's a, a full expanse of, of that room. Um, and, um, you know, really always, you know, the challenge of, of working with fixed elements, but we are able and have been able to really transform this room each and every exhibition, which is, makes it way more exciting than working in a, in a rectangular room. So um, that's been, been fun to do. And next. Yeah, so one of the one of the aspects of working like this is also to create mock-ups, and um, um, the museum was working on these mock-ups. We coordinated it so that I, I could come up at the at the same time, and really uh, had so much fun uh, with the team looking at, at how these objects will fit on the table. This helps us obviously determine our sizes and what makes sense and how people circulate around this, what they're going to see from all angles. So it was um, it was really really fun to see see the team in action setting this up in the workspace. And yeah, so um, I, something that I think uh, Kit was alluding to was sort of the these tables that were created. And and in the beginning we were like, well, why don't we get an old table or why don't we get you know a beautiful uh, tablecloth that could be on here, but playing along with that sort of juxtaposition of 18th century and modernity, we we wanted to really then abstract these elements, and so I think it 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 really makes for a wonderful balance to see these uh, pure forms here. The drum of the table, um, I think you saw the the dressing table earlier, that pure oval form. Um, and what's been what you're seeing that pink reflection is the is the um, the neon sign, which was a, such a brilliant idea, kind of reflecting into here. So it really gives you this little bit otherworldly um, feeling in this space, which I think is also something we were we were trying to capture. Um, so these are some drawings that we did to better understand the three-dimensional space. And so this is part of our process is to, after we do a lot of those flat drawings, is to actually look at something in 3D. So this was the beginnings of trying to understand the Northumberland room and what we could do there. Next. And so something that was inspiring to us was to think about, uh, we, you know, we wanted, the space is not a gigantic space to work with, but we, we, so we did want to have transparency between the spaces, but, and not have these sort of fixed walls. And so something that we were looking toward was making, um, so looking at this kind of sheer fabric that could be printed on and really give you the sense of what the room could have been like entering, uh, but also keep it in a modern way of this new material or this, this material, use, using this material in this way to really give you um, a sense of the room. Uh, and, and if you go to the next slide, you'll see um, this. So we rendered that so that you can sort of see through. So the, the scrim where I'm talking about is on either side, um, as you can imagine. And uh, then next, and looking at it the other way. So standing in the North Umberland room, looking back, and then in its next slide, uh, in that execution. Uh, so it, it really, we thought was 
came out very well and really gave you this sort of sense of kind of like the glass feels that you're always sort of seeing through something. Um, and there's a lovely pink uh, that we had, we, we embraced right away because we, we love the idea of that, that pink going around. Next. And uh, so we studied quite a bit, you know, uh, Kit had the idea of the neon and we, we, we jumped all over that because we thought that was a very cool idea and very sort of modern um, element here. And we actually looked a lot at the fonts and should we make this very sort of, um, you know, modern font or really play up using the neon and this, this, uh, this cursive and we landed on this. Uh, which I think really is wonderful. If you go to the next slide. Um, oh, okay, maybe that's out of sequence. But uh, anyway, this is our entrance uh, into the exhibition, which is always uh, interesting in this space to figure out what the best way into the space is. And it really begins and sets up the story here uh, with our feet and the, and the, and the images of, the, of people uh, on the wall. It was really fun. Uh, next. Yeah, so here is um, an, another visualization of that, that opening uh, entrance area that Kit had been talking about. And next, uh, and in its execution, which um, again, the, the, the combination of that neon and the, the, the visuals and the sound uh, to, the, to, to the right, uh, and then peering in and peeking into the, to the actual exhibition was um, again, uh, something we were really trying to achieve that kind of mystery and um, interest into the space. Next. Oh, I think that's it for me. Right. Warren, is it you? Yeah, sir, I'll, I'll jump in. Thank you for the um, quick romp through. It is a difficult space, certainly to design. It's probably a little difficult for our uh, guests today who haven't been in the space to actually understand it um, as well as, as uh, we have come to. Um, but it, it uh, maybe just bears repeating that the, that entire um, sort of immersive space with the neon that introduces you to the party sits outside of and we peer in as you showed in your last slide uh, through the window to what is to come. And then the um, extraction of the figures from the historical print uh, taking a promenade like just down the hall a little bit and we put exactly um, neon footprints on the floor so that they could follow it. I mean it isn't necessarily intuitive and that is one of the design challenges that we learned from exhibition evaluation over the years that people need more guidance, actual physical wayfinding. Um, and we, we hope, the while the evaluation is, um, has taken place for this exhibition and we're, we're doing the analysis now and we hope that these cues that you helped us uh, provide, um, you know, take people efficiently into the, the main gallery space, uh, which is then subdivided, as you say, into these different parts of the day. Um, but in the end, all the visioning that uh, Kit had and all of the um, you know, precision of design and inspiration that um, Seldorf brings in the end has to be executed by our team, um, who was ably led by Warren, but um, encompasses a wide number of additional talented staff, um, preparators, conservators, our lighting designers, um, and folks in our graphics team, uh, who also all work with your firm throughout the entire build project to make sure that we get those atmospherics right. And as you say, make those you know, jewel-like objects really pop out of that mirror wall, all those reflective services, not an easy thing. But um, let's turn for um, now the next 10 minutes or so to Warren, who's going to give us a walk through the, the build process um, from vision to design to build. Great, uh, thanks, Carol Ann. And thank uh -huh. you, Kit and Sarah and everybody who was involved in in creating such a beautiful and as we've heard today, immersive uh, exhibition experience and now a uh, seminar experience as well. Um, so as Carol Ann mentioned, you know, all of the areas that I manage here at the museum um, were basically involved in every aspect of the development of an exhibition and the, and the implementation of the exhibition, um, except for that interpretation uh, portion. But we do actually work closely with the interpretation team to make sure that, um, that the physical is reinforcing that interpretive goal of the show. 
So, um, you know, to take a step back, we don't actually have a, an exhibit designer on staff in the museum, uh, but we actually see that as a positive. It gives us an opportunity to work with different, um, different designers for different projects. And what we will do is take a look at the exhibition and then try to sort of uh, pinpoint from our experience um, the designer that we think would sort of um, take the best approach uh, and a most successful uh, approach for this. So, um, you know, working with different designers adds this real variety to the exhibitions and there's no sort of homogeny of the same look and feel. And as um, Sarah pointed out, it is called the changing gallery and it really drastically changes from year to year. Um, so this idea of working with different designers adds variety, but working with designers that we have already worked with in the past, there's a certain familiarity there's an understanding of what the limitations and challenges of that space are. There's um, an understanding of how we communicate and how we get the work uh, done well together. And, and Sarah and Annabelle and their team, we have had um, incredible success working with them. Um, and there really is a great um, energy in those meetings and, and, and obviously a great result with the exhibition. So um, it's definitely a pleasure to work with them. Um, one of my primary roles in the exhibits is I'm really the translator um, for taking the curator and the designer's vision and translating it into a physical form. And you know, luckily I speak designer and luckily I speak curator, and, but I also have to be multilingual and I have to be able to talk to the contractors and help them understand, okay, I know this is what the design says, but here's the limitations of the material. How are we gonna kind of come up with a solution? So you know, Sarah alluded to some of the challenges of converting these existing cases to that sort of long, beautiful mirrored wall surface. Um, and I'll show a few images where it sort of shows sort of the guts of that, um, the mechanics of how that goes together, sort of how the sausage gets made. Um, just real quick about our exhibition planning process, to sort of help realize these visions, um, we've kind of struck upon a pretty innovative approach with our exhibits. So there's a core team, so it would be Carol Ann, myself, um, the curator of the exhibit, uh, the exhibition designer, uh, our head of interpretation, and then of course, a curatorial assistant who helps add um, order to the chaos. So thank you, Linnea, who's out there and who did a fabulous job. And underneath, so that core team is pretty nimble and pretty small and it, it, it's a pretty high functioning team. And then there are two separate sub teams. So there's one dedicated to interpretation and that's led by uh, Troy Smythe. And that includes representatives from all across the museum. So we have people from the studio, from hot glass, from the shops, um, from publications. So it really is this would create a sort of a, um, an understanding of what the, what the show means and what it's about. So we can sort of spread through the entire organization, all these tendrils and connections. And also we're getting feedback from all those people in terms of how, how to best pr um, produce this exhibition, if you will. And then I lead the, uh, the logistics team and that team is made up of all of the parts and pieces that are going to carry out the physical work. So it includes um, our collections team, both uh, preparators and registrars, our conservation staff, uh, digital uh, and AV, our photography staff, our lighting folks. So it's the real nuts and bolts um, uh, activity that happens. Um, but we've we've sort of struck on a really good, you know, the core team is sort of the nexus, and those two teams feed back information back to and from. But um, we really have um, come to really um, great results. And again, that translation from these um, drawings from plan elevation and these renderings to the to the sort of the reality is really sort of our, our chief task. So um, I'll take the next slide, please. Uh, and as I mentioned, all of our areas really focus on the care and display of collections. And I really have to strike, and our team always has to strike this balance of the, the aesthetic and the physical safety of the artwork and or our staff and visitors. And so, um, you know, at times there's, uh, you know, no, no designers we know here, but uh, designers, curators, artists that want to display artwork in sort of unconventional ways. And, you know, I'm always like, they, I don't want any barrier. And like, well, we, we want a really big one. And so we have to sort of strike upon this sort of the balance. And I think that, you know, this exhibition is a really great example of that balance where, you have really clean, clear access to the ob information and the objects. Um, the barriers don't read as sort of a hindrance to the experience, um, but we're also you know, meeting our obligation of keeping all these loans and, um, and objects safe. Uh, before I take you through sort of the, these sort of before and after photos, I did wanna give special acknowledgement to our collections team, our conservation staff and our photographers um, who also do our exhibition lighting. Um, you know, they, we planned, we adapted, we executed the installation. The team was 
an incredible um, oiled machine. And I think it was a really, really positive experience for all of them, uh, all within the, um, you know, within dealing with the challenges of COVID. So, you know, kudos to the team. They really pulled this one off. So, um, okay, I'll take the next slide, please. And so I know we've seen this image a few times, but this converting a vision, you, know, you saw the rendering to the physical of um, when do the graphics go on the wall? What gets painted first? How are we gonna clean up these edges? Where does the paint sort of stop at this edge and change color to another edge? Um, it's all part of that process. Um, you can see the big red X on the window was during installation. It's sort of the equivalent of the, the um, dots on the windows to keep the birds from flying through. So um, believe it or not, we have had people walk into glass before. And so, you know, we're, we're always safety minded. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm just showing this one again, sort of the guts of the wall, but um, you know, we really have to think through when heavier fragile objects are going to be hanging on a wall, we need to make sure there's enough wall there to hang on. So um, you know, we, we try to map out where there's going to be blocking in the wall, um, where the, you can see just how that sort of window opening was constructed and then skinned, um, where the deck was built up. And we actually tried in many cases to reuse a lot of display materials. We used um, gorilla glass barriers that we had left over from uh, the contemporary art and design wing, um, label stands that we had for both iPads and labels, things like that. So that's my uh, my hat also on the green green team here is sort of reuse and reduce our waste. So we're trying to make smart decisions in our exhibits as well. Uh, next slide. So this is uh, a detail on the left of that. There are two freestanding cases that are built against the wall um, and how to create this sort of contiguous um, space and also build out the center that is normally a recess there to get that sort of consistent um, consistent look. As Kit pointed out earlier, where we had the central um, element where we built the graphic frame to sort of hide some of the flaws of the build, part of our challenge was the limitations of materials. So that span is seven, eight feet wide, but epoxy glass doesn't come in eight foot by eight foot pieces. It comes in four by eight sheets. And how do you how do you make a beautiful display window and limit the number of seams and openings? And how do you access it when there's a bug in there later or to install the work? So these are all things that we sort of work through these logistical aspects. The picture on the right is obviously the mirrored surface and that sort of finished, um, finished exterior um, post construction. So another pretty successful element of the show. Uh, next slide. Uh, so a, a few more of our installation shots. So on the left, um, as Sarah mentioned, you know, we do mock up a lot of uh, our displays and we really were working through um, along with our accessibility team and sort of our, our mindset of making our exhibits as accessible to everyone as possible, um, really tried to work through how do we present the information um, in a clean and readable way. Um, one of the things that we've hit upon, and you've seen it in a few of these images, the, the image on the left shows these sort of slant label rails. And what the benefit of those is, is when you're lighting the object from above, the light spills down over the front of those label rails and makes them very easily, uh, more easily read. The thing that we have been really um, working on, and uh, the accessibility team actually did an evaluation of this exhibit to walk through and identify, you know, the successes. So we've really pumped up our point sizes. We really like you know, increase the sort of the angle to be able to get these things lit well. Um, but in other cases, uh, you know, the conservation concerns of textiles and um, watercolors sort of is a pushback on the accessibility thing. You sort of fix one problem and cause another. Um, and so, you know, we, we try to mock these things up and really make things um, as clean and, um, and uh, physically functional as possible. Uh, on the right-hand image, you can see uh, one of our conservators working with uh, Eric, who you saw give a fantastic demo earlier to sort of start populating the dessert table. That was a mix of collection objects, uh, one loan actually that large dessert stand in the center, um, and then these handmade objects that our glass um, makers made. And so to merge those together, we, we want to use our collection in responsible ways. And so we had to line anything that was going to receive sort of the, um, the fruits and, um, and, and sweets we had to line that with mylar and or roplex and wax and things like that to keep from abrading the surface of our object. Because again, part of our mission is to preserve this collection for the future. Um, so that actually that dessert table display took a really, really long time to get installed because there was a lot of real care uh, that went into doing it safely too. So uh, next slide. 
And uh, Sarah showed this image before of the Northumberland room, and I wanted to include again the sort of the, the, the how the sausage is made. So you know, in one, the design called for a 12 foot um, portal or 12 foot 12 inch deep portal, um, but it required us going and having wood milled to that dimension to be able to get the real dimension that the design concept called for. Um, and again, how do we stretch those fabrics where they don't look like a you know a middle a middle school in the 70s with these droopy drapes and um, you know how do we how do we keep them um, that transparency so there's no framework behind them that creates these weird shadows and things like that so there's a lot of real logistical problem solving posed in um, the Northumberland panels are a great example of extremely fragile extremely heavy um, came from London you know we didn't have a courier that was able to travel with them so how do we actually safely install these both physically and also meet our obligations to our lender. Uh, next slide, please. And so the COVID situation obviously has been challenging in so many ways, but it was one of our chief challenges with, um, with accomplishing the installation, because as I mentioned, lenders typically would send a courier to travel with the artwork to be here present to watch it condition reported and installed, and they were unable to come. And so we had to come up with some creative solutions. So. Uh, with the help of our events team, uh, you can see on the left-hand side, uh, Matt, um, who's ably um, running a lot of this seminar, um, was there with dual camera setups. We had laptops open. We were using Teams to communicate with the courier. Basically, we had virtual couriers, um, which sounds you know, great. We weeded out the people, we weeded out the cost, but it was actually, it added a lot of complication, especially with working with time zones and um, other, other people's work schedules and things like that. We have great in-house expertise when it comes to conservation of glass, but we don't have a lot of in-house expertise when it comes to textiles and paper and things like that. So we actually had to seek out outside professionals to bring them in and have them work with us along with our virtual courier. So um, they're preparing the man's dress coat in this particular case. Uh, and I think there might be one more slide. Yeah, this is just another shot where we had a book conservator here and we were working on mounting and installing um, books, but you get a chance to see the camera setups, um, we had one camera that was sort of static and then one that could sort of zoom in on the work that was happening. Um, and we've always said, you know, we've all gone out on courier trips and had either positive or negative experiences. And, and one of the things we really strive for is we want to be, we want people to come and work with us and walk away and be like, wow, they really have their stuff together and are super professional. And again, I think in the face of adversity, we really did a fantastic job on the show. So I believe that is my last slide and I'll turn it back over to Carol Ann. Thanks, um, I, I agree with you. We can't emphasize enough um, all the twists and turns that the uh, pandemic threw our way. Um, the virtual courier program um, ended up to be uh, something that we were able to document and share as a protocol with museums around the world for ways of working. Um, I don't recall, Kit or Warren, one of you will, um, how many objects actually were coming on loan to us from various points, Britain or elsewhere in the United States. Um, and uh, most of them, except for maybe a few that were in driving distance, did come via virtual courier. Now on the reverse trip, when we deinstall, <laughs> perhaps it'll be physical couriers again. Oh yeah, but, determined. We've got um, a plan A and a plan B. I don't recall exactly how many we needed to work with, but it, it, the exhibition features, you know, in large part our, our um, collection, but um, many significant North Underville and drawing room, of course, and the, the uh, watercolors from the, and the architectural drawings from the John Soames Museum. Um, extremely important and significant. And the Bealby Goblet was another one that um, was a very uh, complicated one and the gentleman's waistcoat and uh, you know, on and on. Um, Kit, I don't know if you wanted to say anything about those um, relationships, which are another aspect of building the show, is maintaining over a multi-year period, and then all of their exhibition schedules got shifted because of the pandemic, too, so that was another complicating factor. Yeah, absolutely, and it's always a shame not to be able to see colleagues from other institutions in person. Curing objects is a great highlight of museum work. You see other people's work, you learn about other institutions' programs, so that was a um, that was a disappointment, but it, it, it did instill this aura of uh, reverence in the exhibition gallery and courier trips can often be quite frenetic. You know, there are several of us there at once installing and so forth, but there had to be complete silence because of the, the audio issues. Um, so one object at a time, 
only for people who absolutely needed to be there. It's kind of almost therapeutic mm -hmm. uh, in a way. Yeah, yeah. We did have the, the grace of uh, the closure did give us a little bit more time. Um, and as you say, the, the tone of installation was not uh, um, as frenetic as sometimes is the case. And um, with something as complex as that, that was a welcome silver lining, I guess. Um, another little silver lining or surprise, Kit just told me in the, in the chat, um, we have a, um, a surprise feature for our guests today. I do want to remind everyone, however, that if you ha do have questions for our panel, please put them in the Q&A um, function feature down at the bottom of, the, of your screen, and we'll be glad to offer those questions up to the panel. But Kit, you want to introduce our treat, our visual treat? I would love to. And, I, and so, Scott, we're going to show the video, but I'll just let the AV team set it up, but I'll just introduce it. So we've mentioned the, the neon sign uh, several times in this, this panel, and it was designed and donated to us by um, Bag Signs, which is a Brooklyn-based uh, neon company that, as I mentioned in the, the introduction, the start of this session, um, was just established in 2019. And it's um, uh, a studio that supports uh, the queer community. Um, and well, you can go to their website and you can order your own neon signs. It also establishes neon as a kind of an art form. It's, it's a medium that's getting increasing interest in the contemporary glass world at the moment. Um, in any case, they've made this five minute video which details the, this, this collaboration, which is really fun and very camp. And I hope you'll enjoy it. So Scott, take it away. Sparkling Company is a broad sweeping survey of the many meanings, innovations and functions of glass in Britain during the 1700s. And its aim is really to show what it meant to be modern at that time through a lens of glass. We wanted to use neon to convey the sense of modernity um, of the 1700s, the self-conscious awareness of modernity that people felt at that time. It was a really happy coincidence that um, Matthew was speaking at the seminar organized in 2019, the Year of New Glass Now, and he introduced Bag Sign, which was just starting up at the time. And at that moment, I was thinking about camp in the 18th century, and it felt like a really good way to make the connection to the modernity that I wanted to conjure up, but also to the notion of camp and serving the queer community uh, in the way that Bag Signs does and supporting them and giving them a platform. What was exciting to me about working with Bag Signs is that it represented a sector of the industry that wasn't really represented at this stage. A lot of neon at this point, until the last like maybe seven to ten years, was very relegated to a commercial industry. So with that, when the project with Corning Museum came up, it was really exciting to work on a project that was based in reframing glass as something that was camp, because honestly that's how I think of it a lot of the time. Is super fragile, you're kind of breathing into the, the object you're creating and imbuing a lot of your own person into it. The letter A covers all of the more basic bends and is a good warm-up letter. It covers the right angle, the double back, and the drop-down bend all in one letter. If you master just three bends, you can do like half the alphabet. The first step in bending A will be measuring the glass. I'll usually, I'll cut the glass first in half and then that'll leave me with a more manageable length. Use my soapstone, which we use to mark glass because it's heat resistant and it's good at mark making. I'll use my cork to close the system when I have my blow hose attached because this is what I use to put air into the tube. Because once you heat glass up and bend it, it collapses and you don't want that to be the permanent state of your letter. So you put air back in to reform it. When you're heating up the glass, the steps are heat, bend, and then blow. What goes into neon to make it light up is one of two gases usually, which is argon or neon. Neon is sort of a misnomer. Most signs you see that are any color other than red will be filled with argon and then a bead of liquid mercury, which then vaporizes when it's under heat um, to mix with the gas to react with the phosphor, which is the white or yellow coating on the clear glass to make a color. We've introduced the neon sign in 
an immersive entry point to the exhibition where we evoke Vauxhall Pleasure Gardens, which was London's hottest night spot. You could have dinner outside, you could watch fireworks, you could see contemporary art, you could listen to the latest music, you could have sex in bushes, you could do all the things that we in the 21st century would recognise as being fun. But it was really famous for its lighting, for its lanterns. It had thousands of glass lanterns suspended from trees, which could all be lit in an instant because they were connected by a single fuse soaked in flammable liquid. So at a certain point in the evening, somebody would go out with a, a lit taper, touch one end of the fuse, and all the lights would sparkle on. So that felt like a, a good thing to riff off. And neon, I think, is a great um, contemporary equivalent to that. It's urban, it's eye-catching, it's innovative um, and seedy. All the things that I kind of wanted to conjure up for Vauxhall and for this sense of modernity in, in Britain at that time. Neon is just sort of starting to reach the zeitgeist of fine art and with this exhibit it's really um, sort of solidifying that place in many ways. It's, Corning is a huge museum, very well respected around the world for glass as a medium and I think Neon is often left on a separate table to the rest of glass so for it to be included in such a traditional survey of the medium is really exciting. It's, it definitely is elevating it from the commercial into the art which is I think right, right at this point. In sparkling company, glass and the costs of social life in Britain during the 1700s opened on May 22nd and will run through to January 2nd, 2022. Well, that was incredible. <laughs> what a treat. Um, Kid, I hope you'll, you'll thank Matthew and all his colleagues. I love the playful music and, uh, you know, just mind-boggling to me who has very little understanding of science so, frankly um, how that happens but um, what a gift um, thank you very much uh, you know it's hard to turn back to a serious-minded panel after that um, but uh, we could close here or Sarah I don't know if you had any uh, closing remarks about uh, Seldorf and how it thinks about working with um, particularly the challenges of glass in uh, designing uh, an exhibition I it, for those of you who don't know, Seldorf is an enormously uh, important design firm for lots of reasons, but is significantly changing the shape of what museums look like today. Um, working on many, uh, not only exhibition designs, but full um, building reimaginings. Uh, the Frick, the National Portrait Gallery, the National Gallery in Britain, um, I don't know, they go on and on, but uh, very important work. And uh, our museum has to be a little different than most. Definitely, and uh, you know, you know, work we do work on other exhibitions outside of Corning, um, obviously, and large part is contemporary art. Um, but it's always in, just incredible learning experience with you guys. Uh, like you know, not not knowing all of the details that you guys know about uh, the glass pieces and that that immersive uh, nature. Um, that you bring to um, to your work uh, really is like so inspiring and makes us so excited about things I never thought I would be excited about. Um, and so I I think you know it, we we take each and every project we do with the specificity of who we're dealing with. Um, so I I think that we don't we don't have a set style or if you will or anything like that. And and I think um, working with in this method really keeps keeps us going and keeps us honed in on our our, our skills of, of really looking at in things in great detail. So thank you guys for, for the opportunities. Thank you, Sarah. And we, as I say, look forward to the work we'll be doing for our next year's exhibition, uh, which will open in May. And we're, we're, we're waiting for the big reveal on that one. I think we're at time. Um, and I wanna thank each of you, Warren, Kit, and Sarah for uh, everything that you've provided to us so generously today. Um, and we have a note there saying, Annabelle worked with the Clark, of course, in the refurbishment of the original museum building. She is awesome, mm -hmm. <laughs> then and now. Um, so thank you to everyone. And I'm gonna hand it over to you, Kit. I think you're closing out the day today. Um, yes, thank you. Well, thank you. Um, well, a huge thank you to everyone who has stuck with us uh, through this, uh, this first session. Um, I've given myself half an hour for wrap up. I really don't think that's necessary. It really just remains for me to uh, sincerely thank all the moderators and panelists for working so hard to uh, pull this all together. 
and preparing uh, presentations and um, joining from different time zones. Um, it's really, really um, very much appreciated. Um, we'll be meeting again tomorrow, I hope, at 10 a.m. Eastern time um, for quite a different day. We'll be um, joining four panel discussions, which will be informed by the, as I mentioned earlier, the, the pre-recorded papers, links to which um, you, you should have received. Again, if you haven't watched them all, that's not a problem. Um, each speaker will recap their research so we can all uh, be on the same page as it were. So wherever you are, I hope you have a great um, rest of day. Um, again, use the same link that you use today to log back in tomorrow. It'll be absolutely fine. And I look forward to seeing you then. So goodbye for now. <laughs>